I want to thank you all for being here. And uh, most importantly, I want to thank this incredibly uh, distinguished panel of educational experts. I don't think we could have, you know, assembled a better group for us to talk about the topic that we have today that is on everyone's mind. Uh, very important. I'm just going to give a few introductions, and then uh, Dr. Aronson is going to lead the discussion. And uh, for, um, for those that don't already know these wonderful individuals, um, we have Joshua Aronson here with us. He directs the Mindful Education Lab, a group of psychologists and neuroscientists dedicated to using research to improve the environments and psychological functioning and learning of people confronted with stress. And boy, is that timely right now, both for students, parents, educators, uh, and the general public, quite frankly. Uh, he is going to uh, talk and lead the discussion. Uh, just so you know, you have a bio in front of you. Uh, it's so extensive. He's written many books and uh, on, on various subjects, and you'll have an opportunity to, uh, after they give their talk, uh, to ask him direct questions. We are also joined by uh, one of Connecticut's top educational leaders that is part of the very famous NEAG School of Education at UConn, uh, Dr. Morgan Donaldson, the endowed professor of education policy and leadership and associate dean of research at the university. So again, her extensive bio is right there for you to read. Additionally, we have Peter Valentin. Peter is a senior lecturer and chair of the Forensic Science Department of the University of New Haven, home to one of the oldest and most respected forensic science programs in the United States. You all remember Dr. Henry Lee, you know, his mentor and certainly a, a leader in that area. And his interest has been the new students coming into the university and what he's finding that has changed there. We also are joined by Andrea Leonardi. She had special services. She's assistant superintendent of the Wilton School System and can really speak to the demanding uh, issues around special education students and parents right now. Uh, additionally, we wanted to make sure we had um, all areas represented. We have Bianca Cortland Cox. She is vice president of legislation public policy uh, for the Connecticut Association of the Gifted. Uh, and she also has been up and around legislative policy up at the Capitol for many years and really understands uh, what's going on with that population, but additionally focused on the intercity child with gifts. She calls them the invisible genius. We're also pleased to have with us Jesse Ballas Harris. Uh, Jesse has an interesting um, responsibility. He is with Achievement First. The school that you most would identify with is the Amistad School, very first one of Achievement First in New Haven. And he works to support 34 elementary and middle schools in creating the conditions for students to thrive and grow. So I believe we have public schools, charter schools, we have the university sector all represented here to address this very important topic. And we want you all to, to listen and also to participate in the second half of our program. And we thank you all for taking this very busy Saturday morning to be with us today. So, Dr. Aronson, please lead us off. Thank you. So, we decided as a panel that we would each speak, speak very briefly about the issues that the pandemic raised or exposed. Um, and then after that, we would talk about some of the things we we see as opportunities embedded in this crisis for improving education to be even better than it was before. Often a crisis exposes cracks in the foundation of uh, organizations, houses, when they, and I think all of us in this room are experts in some way about how that happened. Um, I've invited a few young people who can share their lived experiences about um, this, what they went through, so that us experts are not the only voices in the room, but um, we share in that conversation. So the overarching question is, what, how do we use what we've learned um, to make things better? And so let's, let's start with my take on what we've learned, both from research and from visiting schools as I do. Um, it's been interesting to look at how different schools handled the pandemic. Um, 
often it was left to each teacher to figure out a way. Um, and I think that exposed some interesting facts about our educational system. But one thing you'll hear a lot about that happen is that kids lost two years of learning. And um, learning loss is a strange word because they didn't really have a lot of the learning that they supposedly lost. They just didn't get the learning. So missed learning. But even that is not, the, I think, the best way of understanding what happened. I, as I've traveled and talked to teachers, it seems like um, we could also talk about what happened. What did they learn during that time? Because kids are always learning. And some of the kids we worked with as we um, examined their schools as they got back into school showed that they had indeed never developed social skills. Um, one of the comments we heard from a director of really wonderful network of schools that really do right by kids is that we're now having to teach fifth graders kindergarten lessons. Basic, how do you share? How do you work together? How do you, how, how do you support another kid? Kids were coming in often from families that didn't work such the, the world's greatest parents, and then we're showing up to school with uh, deficits in how to basically sit still and get along and do school. So at the same time, some kids learned how to teach themselves during this time. And so there's all kinds of lessons to be derived from this. I think the way I think about the pandemic is having exacerbated a lot of ongoing problems. So teachers were already quitting and leaving the field for lack of respect, lack of money, um, and the kinds of arguments that, that are, were dividing families and schools, things like critical race theory. Um, school shootings were getting teachers understandably depressed. So there was already a spike in mental health problems in this society. There's a, a magazine from Wilton and Westport, and the cover was just the big word anxiety on it. And it talked about how uh, one in four kids suffers from clinical level, levels of depression in our community. That was in 2018 before the pandemic. That's, those rates may have doubled. At NYU, where I teach, I, I, I observed in the last year that um, casually that I thought 40% of my students should be in therapy rather than college. And from a parent's perspective, that's an expensive prospect to pay that money to have a kid stumbling their way through college. And I watch 40% of my students unable to do the things we're asking them to do at the college level. So we need to, but, but even before the pandemic, that was the case even before the pandemic. So we've been losing learning and we've been having mental health problems for a long time now. And the pandemic just sort of threw a big magnifying glass on that. Um, so those, all of those things needed to be repaired before the pandemic. Now they really need to be repaired. And so I look forward to talking to all of us about what, those, what we might do to climb out of this. I will give you one hint. I, I've asked everybody to come up with one move. Um, it's making schools the kind of place that everybody wants to be in. That's one hint. Which I love. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to talk about five big points that I think that the pandemic showed to us and the recovery has shown to us. The first, which Joshua referred to, is that the pandemic was, as we all know, tre tremendously challenging for students and educators. So we, the missed learning or lost learning or learning gaps um, of, you know, a year to two years um, uh, lower than what they might be. We also know it was tremendously difficult for educators. Um, and it seems like turnover is climbing back to where it was before pandemic, but vacancies are huge. So shortages in teachers are statewide, 
their nationwide, um, fifty percent of all school districts or all schools reported at least one vacancy last um, February. So this is going to be a real issue moving forward. Is just having the trained, capable, skilled teachers that we need our children to have uh, working with them. A second point is that the pandemic was much more harmful educationally and um, more broadly to some students than others. So um, low-income students fared more poorly academically through the pandemic, as well as Black, Latino, and American Indian students, um, younger students as well. Um, younger students, their learning gaps are the largest, were the largest coming out of the pandemic, followed by middle school, followed by high school. Um, also students with disabilities, um, which Andrea is probably going to take up, uh, they also um, suffer disproportionately from the pandemic. And lastly, <coughs> students who are lower scoring going into the pandemic, um, we see the largest gaps coming out of them. A third key point, which really concerns me, not just as an educator, and as a researcher, but also as a parent, and frankly, as a taxpayer, is some of the estimates of what this learning loss or mislearning is going to cost us if we don't adequately address it. So a recent paper um, from the Wharton School suggested that our GDP in 2051 will be 1.4% lower than it would be otherwise if we don't adequately address these gaps. So this is a huge issue uh, for all of us. Um, the fourth point is that recovery does seem to be happening. So um, a recent report from over the summer looked at the recovery and found that this is national data, fourth, fifth, and sixth graders as of last spring were closing some of those gaps. They had closed about 25% of the gap over the course of last year. The sort of kind of negative side of that story is some students are not closing the gap as readily. So last spring, seventh and eighth graders were not didn't show any progress on the gap, um, as well as Black, Latino, American Indian students. Their closure of the gap was not as great, as well as um, low-income students. So it's a something to really, really pay attention to and something that we all need to be concerned about. So kind of bottom line, there's much, much more to be done. The federal government has invested about $200 billion in, um, in uh, addressing the pandemic in schools and accelerating learning, but by some estimates, it will require $500 billion. So it's, this is the sort of thing where we have to be careful about um, investing, to, assuming that a short-term fix will, will do what we need it to do. We're really not talking about a short-term fix. This is a longer-term fix um, and an opportunity to really rethink schools, teaching, learning, relationships between kids, families, and, and um, educators. Um, it's also important to think about the, uh, the sort of the estimates of the time to recover learning. So um, again, on the study from the summer estimated that Last spring, seventh and eighth graders would take about five years to, to cover that gap in their learning, and that the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders would be three to five years. So this is, again, this is not something that we can sort of return to normal. Um, we need to rethink what we're doing, and we need to um, address the gaps, but also not feed into the widespread anxiety among students. Um, so really, that's the question, I think, for educators, for families, for the public, is how do we address the gaps, recognize them, um, but also not uh, create tremendous levels of anxiety in students, families, and educators as we move forward. Um, and so I'll move it, pass it on to you. Thank you very much. Um, I actually feel a little unprepared. There's two pages of <laughs> <laughs> typewritten notes, and I literally I'm wrote a my notes. I, I, can't, I can't help it. So well, am I, but apparently not a good one. <laughs> She's a dean. Yeah. <laughs> I'm only a chair. Which just means I have more time. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I probably should have prepared more because I'm, I'm so accustomed to talking about crime scenes and DNA and fingerprints and so. Um, but uh, I'm appreciative of, of the opportunity to be here with everyone because I'm. I would say I'm the recipient of the students who have uh, had these issues. And so a little bit of background is in order. So I'm the chair of the forensic science department at the University of New Haven. 
small school, but the forensic science program carries this outsized weight. It's the Henry C. Lee College of Criminal Justice and Forensic Science. So we are the largest forensic science program in the United States with about 650 undergrad students. And so we are obviously a very rigorous STEM-focused program. And so it stands to reason that if there is a change or if there is a loss of learning in high school students, who is going to see it most soon or the soonest, it would be uh, my colleagues and I. And so certainly that's what we've seen. Uh, the loss of learning over the last two years has essentially created, and frankly, the reason why I didn't need these notes is because I've been uh, making these arguments for the last uh, year and a half. Mm -hmm. um, now, what we're seeing, are, I, I think, versions of two things, and perhaps they're combined. One, you have students who essentially got grades that they didn't otherwise earn. Why? Because the modalities were changed. Um, we, as you know, teachers, were, were more permissive. Of, of what was happening inside the classroom, outside the classroom, on Zoom. And so we didn't know how to grade. We didn't know how to teach. And so it would have been unfair for us to penalize the students for our inability to effectively convey this information. And so students got grades that didn't actually reflect pre-pandemic levels of learning. And so students came in with GPAs that looked like GPAs of previous incoming classes. But what did we find out that when we gave them and they ran through the gauntlet of first year courses that they do, they they couldn't manage the workload. The other part, part of this, and I think they're commingled, they're not one or the other, is that students were not as confident that they did do the work. But because the modality was atypical, because the, you know, the learning outcomes were not quite aligned with what was done in the past, the moment that the students ran into any sort of obstacle, which is, of course, part of the college experience, they didn't have the, the fortitude to power through because they, they really hadn't worked that way before. You know, my student learned, well, my student, my son, who is also a student, uh, of course, he's not here with me today. He hears dad talk way too much anyway. Um, you know, I watched him work remotely and, and I saw that, you know, there was no long-term planning on his part because it was always, well, I have to do this for the next class, the next Zoom session. And so I, I, as I saw that, I realized that one big thing that students are not getting is they're not developing the executive functioning skills so that they can manage a college experience. Now, our program is uh, generally students come in taking 18 credits in both their first year semesters. And students generally come in having to take calculus, biology, general chemistry, and then, of course, two additional classes, 18 credits both semesters. And, you know, obviously that's a very busy schedule, but there's also a lot of free time. And so the students who tend to do well are the students who have planners, the students who put study time in their plan, you know, that, that have everything planned out. Um, those are the students who tend to recognize the commitment that they've now engaged in. And that's what we're not seeing, that students, because they've been managing for the next day and not for a semester or the next week or the next big project, they would quickly fall behind. And because they lack the confidence because of the last two years, they would fall behind very, very quickly. And so the last thing that I want to mention here is that the University of New Haven obviously is not alone in trying to deal with this at a, at a higher education level. And of course, we have a you know, Center for St Student Success, a, st a Center for Learning Resources, where we try to tutor and give students assistance. But what we're finding is that students aren't reaching out for those services soon enough. And so what happens is they, they essentially lose their first semester because they retreated instead of, you know, embraced the challenge and looked for the help that they, they otherwise would have needed. And because they lack the underlying confidence that they should have been in the program that they're in, they, they drop out. That, that the first bad semester turns into a first bad year. And so we find students who are now in their sophomore year questioning whether or not they should have gone into this degree program at all. And that's not a forensic science problem. That's not even a, you know, that's a universal problem that we need to address is giving the students the confidence, giving students and then frankly, destigmatizing the need for help or just asking for help. And um, one thing that we've done is I've, I've tasked one of my younger faculty members to essentially become a, a shadow advisor for all of them. And so not to engage them faculty member to student because I do that. And of course, you know, if I say, there's a center for resources, you can go get help. Nobody listens to me. <laughs> but if they are continually interacting with a younger faculty member who's not making, who doesn't have that, you know, classroom experience with them necessarily, and just continually points out all the things that we have available to them, 
our hope is that we get students to reach out to them, us as faculty members, sooner so that they can salvage that first semester. Because even if somebody changes their mind in sophomore year and they realize that this major isn't for them, they're already damaged from that first year of, of not doing well and having their, you know, and just doubting whether or not they're prepared for college or in the, or they're in the right field. And that's what I'm really trying to avoid. We know students change majors. That's not what I'm trying to prevent. But I'm trying to get students to realize that, you know, the struggle is universal. Everybody has it. And, you know, reaching out for help is actually part of the maturation process that we're hoping to foster in students. So I'm looking forward to the conversation today. Good morning, everyone. Um, you know, agreeing with everyone who's come before me, seeing issues, boots on the ground, we're seeing issues of students with executive functioning issues who don't, um, who are having trouble coming back with the stamina necessary to get through a school day in the way a school day is structured. During the pandemic, they, you know, the schedule was a little more fluid when they were at home and on Zoom and in and out of the day. They could snack when they wanted. They could wear their pajamas to school, they, you know, all of those things. So we're seeing um, some students, not all, but some students having difficulty getting back into the rhythm of a school day with the level of stamina necessary to have that kind of um, energy throughout a six and a half hour or seven hour school day. Um, so it's almost as if, um, not unlike some of us on the adult side, you know, we stopped exercising a little bit when all of our gyms closed. Getting back to the exercise wasn't the same. You weren't at the same level. You had to take a step back and get back to that same level of fitness that you were probably prior to the pandemic. It's a similar kind of metaphor with children. They're getting back to that level of academic, intellectual, executive functioning fitness that they were pre-pandemic. Um, so we see our kindergarten teachers are rolling back to teaching preschool oriented things. Our, our elementary teachers you know, if you have a third grader, you're actually teaching some of the social and emotional content of first and second grade in order to do that. Um, and so that's happening every day. Executive functioning skills, I think we all lost a little bit of executive functioning skill, truly, adults and students alike, because we didn't have to um, utilize those skills while we were all home, right? And so we're all getting back into how do we plan our day and plan in effectively all the things we have to get done to get that done in a day. Um, and students are the same. So we're teaching, we're rolling back to teach those executive functioning skills at ages we previously didn't need to do that. Kids would come in with those skills. And that's including high school students who are very bright and very capable and very engaged in the learning process you know, preparing for the college arms race, which we can talk about differently, but they have to roll back and think about note-taking differently. They have to think about um, studying differently than they did during the pandemic. And for some of our students, our current junior class or even senior class, they haven't had a normal year of high school. They've never experienced it. So their senior year is their first normal, if you can say the word normal, year of high school. That's a challenge, right? And then they're about to head into college. Mm -hmm. So I think mm -hmm. college professors will need to do some of the similar things that we're all doing is rolling back a little bit and remembering that the students have not had the experiences, not necessarily in the content, but in the way they have to manage their day um, in order to be successful and to, and to have the kind of stamina necessary. Uh, the other piece that I'm seeing uh, significantly is um, a lack of what I would call distress tolerance. Um, we're all a little less able to tolerate distress, whether it's I'm not doing well in this class mm -hmm. and I need to, you know, kind of pull myself up by the bootstraps and put in some more energy and effort, or whether it's I'm having a... a a not so great interaction with my friend and I need to manage that and think about that we're having trouble at that first point of distress and kids are falling apart and that's I think 
um, lending itself to some of the anxiety and depression and that uh, what I would call um, languishing. You know, I don't I don't have the spark, the energy, the sparkle to get through some of this stuff anymore. It seems flat. Um, and so we're seeing a lot of kids coming to school with a little bit of a, a flatter affect. Um, I wouldn't term them as kind of clinically depressed. They're not it's not that. It's a it's a flatness. Um, they're having trouble finding the joy. Um, in learning, finding the joy in sports, finding the joy in things that previously were joyful, getting back to them is not as joyful for some kids. And that's lending itself to school. It's lending itself to family life. Um, and it's lending itself to kind of community life. So we have some work to do with all of our students to help them find the joy um, in learning, to find the joy in struggling with a problem, getting a little distressed by it, but jumping back in to try it again, failing and standing back up. Those are some of the things that will take some time to heal um, and some time to you know grow and develop so that our young people can feel like they have a sense of agency in moving their life forward. Um, and so, you know. I'll leave it at that because there's plenty more to talk about, but um, I think it's an important piece. Good morning. Um, I represent the Connecticut Association for the Gifted, and um, we advocate for high potential, high ability, high achieving, and gifted kids. And I would like to explain that some of our constituents also come from the field of dyslexia, or uh, they are on autism spectrum, because these kids, many of these kids, also have gifted characteristics and are able to perform beyond the general uh, level of achievement in one or two domains, sometimes more. Uh, we call these children twice exceptional, and this is kind of a uh, only a few years old uh, characteristic that makes its way into the schools and in some schools there are already special programs for those kids. Um, but first of all I would like to thank Tony because we've been collaborating for many years. Uh, Senator Boucher was, uh, yes Tony, you very <laughs> <laughs> modest, but I have to say uh, we collaborated on many uh, initiatives, legislative initiatives, and were successful. And I grew to appreciate um, Tony's great uh, respect for education and her understanding that if we want to bring our country's potential up and keep our competitiveness in the world, we have to have schools that deliver um, to the needs of every child from special ed through general population to those who are most able. And uh, I would agree with my, uh, so thank you, Tony, first of all. Mm -hmm. uh, um, I would agree with my predecessors on their assessment of uh, what the difficulties are and what the learning losses were during the COVID years. Because we hear from our parents, from teachers, and also as uh, I look at the preliminary results of the special, uh, on the um, uh, Connecticut uh, Department of Education's um, statistics, it looks like uh, children um, at different ages lost um, a lot of learning and the gifted are in the same bandwidth. Hmm. Except that I have a comment here because um, the children who are within those bandwidths are those who are identified gifted or high achievers children. What we are losing from all these statistics, the ones that Morgan mentioned and Josh, are children who are not seen. As Tony said, I call them the invisible genius. We have a lot of children in Hartford or in actually almost 30% of our Connecticut districts that are not even identified even if the Connecticut law mandates 
gifted identification. They are not identified because the schools cannot afford to have programming for those children and um, don't have um, funds to provide teachers with appropriate um, uh, education or, or preparation to serve these kids. Um, so we believe that those kids are suffering incredible learning loss, maybe beyond those two years, uh, because they have been really neglected. I'm from Greenwich. My daughter had the benefit of the best gifted education in the state. But I'm also a representative on, of CAR, and I was able to observe the inequity between what my daughter uh, could experience and what children in Hartford or in the other uh, districts uh, uh, suffer uh, from, basically neglect. And um, I'm hoping that with all of these COVID challenges, we are emerging with maybe more innovation, with maybe more hopefulness for adopting new ways of teaching. And the gifted field has already um, given to the general education field a lot of our techniques like um, Socratic uh, teaching, open-ended questioning, uh, individualized education. That's a big trend and I can see uh, that our State Department of Education is actually placing a great emphasis on trying to achieve individual, um, more individualized type of education for all schools. And if you go to their website, you actually will see that there are uh, several um, guidance documents for teachers and for districts how to proceed on, on, on that path. So generally, I would say, um, there are three issues that our community is concerned with. One is, like was mentioned before, let's take care of our teachers. Because if the teachers, teachers' mental health suffer enormously, if teachers are happy, they will find ways to deliver education to every child. Because that's what teachers are. I'm from Poland. When I, I'm hope I won't cry, but <laughs> I, when I came here and I saw my daughter's school and how the teachers were involved and what amount of work they put into their preparation every day, I just couldn't believe it. They are the hardest, I think, and actually research shows that, American teachers are the hardest working teachers in the world even if they are not as well rewarded for it, but that's another issue. Um, but let's take care of their mental health. When it comes to the children, there is new trend, and the new uh, commissioner, uh, Russell Tucker, is very big on delivering the, on social emotional development. Not only for the teachers, but mainly for the students. And that will serve my constituents as well as all others. Um, so let's take care of our teachers and then let's take care of our students. And in for my uh, group of children that we're concerned with for gifted, I would wish that we achieve 100% identification levels uh, throughout the state. It's possible. We as an organization have, a, have wonderful tools to do that. Um, but first of all, my biggest wish is that every teacher in Connecticut is aware what gifted child looks like. So that child that sits in the corner and complains, or it's smart alecky, and it's inconsistent, and doesn't know how to plan because their mind goes all over the place, these may be your gifted child. Instead of just leaving him or her alone, let's pay attention to them. So um, that's basically uh, my first assessment, um, <laughs> but I'm hopeful. And with that, to my friend. Thank you so much.
Um, well, I feel like I don't have that much to say because people already said a lot of smart things. Um, I, I think that for me, I approach this from the, the position of someone who's been trying to support our teachers and our school leaders through this pandemic um, and through the challenges that I think you so clearly talked about for them. Um, and so the lens that I thought about this question is I, I think that we're asking our school staff to do more, um, often unprecedentedly more, with less in the tank for themselves. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, the experiences of every person during the pandemic is different and there's no one single narrative that, that captures everyone's experience. But I think what we've seen often in our schools is our, our teachers are coming in with their own traumatic experiences, whether that is losing someone they loved, whether that is a serious illness, whether that is being in a position where you get hugs from 30 kids a day to teaching from like a tiny one bedroom apartment for a year. Um, and, and so our teachers are not by and large okay. And they're also watching so many of their peers and the people that they went to school with move into flexible positions where I'm still getting up, I'm going to work, I'm there at seven, but the people that I know, they work from home now and they're, you know, doing work in Cancun while I am soldiering through in the winter. Um, and I think additionally to both of those, as we talked about already, because the pandemic exacerbated so many concerning trends, the national teacher shortage means that our teachers are often covering more. Um, they're often losing prep times. They're often seeing people in quarantines, which means that they then have to pick up slack for folks that are not in the building. Um, not because they're choosing that, but because our approach to illness has changed in ways that are good and in ways that are hard. Um, and so all of this means that our teachers are often tapped out and depleted in ways that we just haven't seen that degree of before. Um, and then they're, they're, they're trying to support kids through the, as I think so many of you really accurately described, a, a, a double-barreled challenge, I think, of our students have a tremendous amount of unfinished learning, foundational concepts that they have not fully had the opportunity to grapple with and experience and solidify their understanding, and the traumatic experiences and the challenges that our students have gone through. Um, and Morgan talked before about the, the disproportionate impact. Our schools overwhelmingly serve communities of color, um, and we've seen the impact of the traumatic experiences and isolation that many of our kids have gone through. Um, and, and what we know is all of the social work, all of the counseling in the world doesn't compensate for those things if our teachers are not able to day in and day out provide the supportive caring environments to have the, the both the skill and the the mental reserves to be able to see those kids that are struggling um as, as communication instead of as a problem or instead of as someone acting out um and so as, as folks have already said i think all of these are challenges that already existed in our country all of these structural inequities and systemic racism and all of the things that have already meant that so many of our kids are walking into school with challenges that we're often under equipped to provide are just exacerbated. Um, and in terms of my like look to the future and my optimism, I, I do think there's an opportunity for us to, people recognize now in a way that I don't think they have previously we need to change the way that we run our schools. We need to change the way that we think about our schools. And I think there's an opportunity to use that recognition to rethink the way that we approach our schools. Because our teachers do work so hard and the answer is not more time or a harder effort. And I think a lot of times that's what it's been reduced to in the past. I think at this point we could have any questions from the audience. This is the middle part of the, of the talk before uh, we start shooting our mouths off about, about solutions. Yes. Do you want to do you want to come up and, and speak into the <laughs> Wonderful. So I'm Sam here. I'm, I'm a nurse practitioner, so I'm not an educator. Um, and my question is that we had all these kids at home and but the parents were also at home. A lot of them were not going into the office. 
So you, we had these two allies, in some families, two allies that could um, join forces with the teachers to keep structure in the days of the children. How much of this um, strategy was ta undertaken, and was there any kind of success in doing so? That sounds like a you question. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take a stab yeah, at it, and yeah. other folks can add on. I, I, <laughs> I appreciate the door-to-door -door delivery of microphones. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think, one, to your point, I, I think the, the lived experience has varied so much, obviously. I think, you know, we have many families who are frontline workers and who are working, in, who are not from, working from home during the pandemic. And then we obviously also have lots of folks who were. I think the thing that I would say is what we experienced is that the most of our folks who were at home were not not working, they were working remotely. And so we tried at the beginning of the pandemic, I think, to do a lot of like, you know, ways that folks would join and support and work through. And what we came to realize over time was that many of our families were actually just like totally frazzled in, in a lot of cases because they were trying to work remotely and manage three kids and figure out how to like juggle a lot of the challenges of the pandemic. And so I think the experience that we had, the positive was I think we got a lot better at communicating with our families because it was so much easier, right? It was like, you see mom and dad walking right by the Zoom screen and it's easy to have the conversation about like, hey, can you, you know, when you're going over homework, have this conversation or do this thing? I think the thing that we had to learn was that the opportunity here from my vantage point was more about increasing the frequency and clarity of our communication and building trusting relationships with families, less about, at least for in, in our experience, less about them providing a lot more in the moment structure for kids. Um, are you done? I'm oh, yeah, sorry. no, no, absolutely. Oh, Go for okay. it. Okay. Uh, I have just a, a quick add. Uh, your question actually very well highlights uh, what I was saying about this uh, two kinds of uh, communities in, in our state. One is like the Fairfield County, where the parents could afford to be at home uh, or had to be at home uh, having a white collar job. And for these parents and for these kids, when it comes to uh, gifted students, the high-performing students, that was almost a good experience in, in some cases. And uh, teachers, because they had fewer students to attend to in those districts where there are gifted programs, these children actually might have learned some skills, to your point, of planning, of uh, maybe putting uh, different projects together into something bigger than they learned so far in school. There is the other side of the parents who are not at home because they have two, three jobs outside that even COVID couldn't disrupt because they, get, they had to serve the communities. And these are exactly the type of kids. Their kids are the invisibles. So that's why I think they lost more than the average student in our state because they are gifted kids who are misunderstood and they have the potential of driving like fast cars, but because they don't get the fuel, their engines sputter all the time. So that's the view from my point of view. Thank you. I would say that um, families, depending on the age range of your children, families had very differing experiences. Mm -hmm. The parents of young children who were also trying to work from home, um, I don't know how they managed. Mm -hmm. I, I truly don't know how they managed um, to do it all and to keep things afloat. Um, we had families go from, I would say, vulnerable financially to having real financial distressors. People have lost their jobs. And so that added to, um, to the the challenges and the stressors on the whole family system. I think students who had the benefit of, um, of more stability during this time had a better chance of being able to come through this learning um, more whole. 
Um, they still had their issues and, you know, will suffer some learning losses that need to be made up. But the more stability that was created in the family system during particularly the long shutdown phase, I think really helped those students maintain a level of stability um, for themselves. Um, but we know through a, a, a host of data coming out in terms of increases in substance use and abuse, increases in domestic violence, increase in family violence, across the board, regardless of socioeconomics, regardless of where in the state you live, we, those, that data is telling us a great deal about what was the level of instability that was happening in our communities and in our families and in our homes during that time. Um, so I don't think we can underestimate the level of stress and trauma that adults went through. Um, we're talking about its impact on students, but the level of trauma that adults went through, regardless of their role, regardless of what they were tasked with during this time, can't be underestimated because of its impact on our students. So the healing needs to happen across the community and provide the resources to families, to rebuilding family life, um, to engaging our communities in rebuilding community life. Uh, we became disconnected from one another, right? So bringing back those opportunities for adults to connect with other adults, students to connect with, make new friends, all those kinds of things is critical um, to, I think, the overall stability of our communities and our schools. Thank you. I, I have a, actually a very simple uh, comment on all of this. Is I think the proximity of students to their parents prevented the development of the self-sufficiency that we need for these students in college. Um, and so the, I think that adds to it. And I don't think I realized that until I just heard this question. But I actually want to make an ancillary point here that uh, you'd mentioned about students not having the, the, the joy or having this flatter affect. And then you talked about um, us as, as, as educators uh, having no fuel in our tank. Mm -hmm. All of my colleagues and I have had you know, careers in forensic science before we became professors in forensic science. And quite obviously, we teach a very interesting field. And what, so what we're accustomed to is seeing a great deal of enthusiasm from our students. They all want to be there. They all worked really hard to get there. And so imagine now we, we have weaker students we also have students with a flatter affect. And because our tank is low, right, and, and any of us will tell you as educators, we derive a great deal of personal satisfaction from seeing our students engaged with our content. So our students aren't engaged with our content. So now, and we're already at a deficit ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so you see that there's a cycle here mm -hmm. that is that has started. Um, and my colleagues are burned out. They're, you know, they're teaching more courses than they should have. They're teaching in, you know, alternate delivery methods. And so I don't know which needs to happen first. Do we need to become more engaged as educators for our students to sort of reemerge or do we need them to reemerge so that we can get reengaged? I'm not sure what the answer is to that, but clearly both need to happen soon. This is great. There's so much to jump off of here. Really, really great conversation. Um, so I just want to uh, just bring a couple points out and one is that if we just look at student performance or student achievement 75% of it comes from non-school factors so the families the neighborhoods the communities they are contributing 75% of anything that shows up on a test and 25% is coming from the school so um, in the, the question about the family's capacity to help out um, in some ways, during the pandemic, we asked parents and families to take on even more than 75%. And the truth is, some families do not have access to the culture of schooling the way that it operates in, in U.S. schools. So it's, it's um, so, you know, you think about um, day laborers who are coming from Guatemala with a fourth grade education, and now you're asking them to participate um, and I know that's not wasn't behind your your um, question, but the tr that's that's those are the students, those are the families that our teachers, some of our teachers are are working with. So um, this is, I think, what contributed 
uh, to the widening gaps over the course of the pandemic. Some families were very well equipped to help out. They had the white collar jobs. Our family, I am an educator. I'm college educated myself. I know I'm, my expertise is in schooling and education. And I was actually pinpointing, okay, here's my seventh grader. Here's what she's missing from the curriculum. I'm gonna go on Amazon. I'm gonna buy that, that you know, pre-algebra book or whatever it was so that she can get what she needs. And so guess what? Surprise, surprise. She did fine. She moved forward. She's doing great in high school. Um, but some, a lot of kids, probably most kids, didn't have that kind of parent uh, there to help them, didn't have those resources, didn't have that access. And then also the, the point about executive functioning. I really like your point, Andrea, about um, that, that adults lost some executive functioning through the pandemic to actually really help support and, um, and really fully provide that structure for our kids. Parents need to have that executive functioning skill too, right? And parents need to be aware of what's coming down the pike for their students, their kids, um, and be able to, to support them. So I just think that um, while there were certainly great success stories and, and, and families that were able to handle this really well. It was absolutely not equitable across the board. And, and we just have to keep that in mind as we're thinking about moving forward. If I could just speak <clears throat> about one group of parents that don't get a lot. The parents of children with the most significant disabilities, Yeah, I think, are parents who put um, the effort um, and the expertise necessary to address many of those needs, I think was um, was something that um, I saw and we engaged with trying to help those those families um, make it through this time, and it was extraordinarily challenging. Um, and many of our families did an extraordinary job, but those families are exhausted now. Yep. Um, and so supporting them now is um, doubly critical. So, so I think I may have a. a you asked the question, Peter, about where we should start with the teachers or the students. And uh, I would like to argue that we should start with the teachers because um, it's, it's a lot like when you're on an airplane and you're traveling with a kid. They tell you, make sure your mask is on first. Mm -hmm. You put your oxygen mask so you can handle the emergency. Um, and I think that we were... We, before the pandemic, already had a bunch of maskless teachers. Mm -hmm. And students learn in all kinds of different ways. And one of the ways that they learn is they look at their teacher and go, is this person having a good time? Is this a good job? Is this a good way to spend my time? And in many cases, they see a person who looks like they're just trying to get through the day. And it. so I, I take my lessons about this stuff from schools that um, we're already narrowing the gap before the pandemic, that we're making kids' lives good. And one of the things that was remarkable, we were writing a book about this school and the pandemic hit. I got to watch them sort of handle this incredible challenge. And they, so 51% of teachers now are saying they're going to quit early. That's up dramatically from before the pandemic. Um, so this school has never had a teacher quit. And in fact, they've had teachers stay on and, and stay at this school for half the pay in a place where the kids are poor and have difficult parents. And so I, I get from this, I take from this, uh, to your point, um, that we have a school system that punishes you for having parents that can't that don't play this game or can't play the game for example if you're gifted and you go to a school that doesn't recognize your gifts it leaves it to the parents to go get a neuropsychologist to test the kid if your parents are from guatemala and the schools whether you succeed or fail depends on you getting your homework done that widens the gap between parents who ride their kids and know how to speak English and know how to do homework. So in a community like this, 
there's all this extra support for students that reinforces a system that punishes you for not having parents that are going to make a job out of getting you through school. And I think we need to rethink that model of schooling deeply. That, you know, my father came up, was poor, and fell in love with books, went to college, and that system, he, he succeeded in spite of that school system. And I think that's happening less and less with poor kids these days. And so I believe deeply that, that it's sort of a, it, it's a system that ought to elevate everybody. And it has not elevated teachers. The teaching profession is one of the last professions my students want to go into. And you meet these amazing students who you know, as soon as a kid would meet them, would go, I want to be like you, I'll learn whatever you want to teach me. We're not getting those people anymore. We're not getting them because they don't want to get chewed up in a system where they're, what they could offer a kid is not appreciated. Or they're working so hard that they and not getting paid enough and they love their kids and they're spending their own money on school supplies. And everything has to be some extra effort to get this kid through on the part of the teacher. Now, I just think the structure is wrong. And I'm going to put one thing out there about the structure. The work that kids do takes a lot of cheerleading and prodding for them to want to do. It, it takes a lot of teachers pushing them, threatening them, parents cajoling them to do their homework. And it doesn't have to be that way. If we structure work in ways where children are doing things that are interesting and the teachers are creatively taking those things that they're making along with teachers, projects, and matching them to the standards that we want kids to learn, it works beautifully. And I got that from a school, not, not, I didn't get that from a psych book, I got it from visiting a school that many of these people in this audience have seen, where kids are treated like they were your kids, because the principal put her own kids in the school. And the principal also taught a class. So it's a school based on empathy. I have my own kids in here. I know what it's like to be a teacher. And from that, a model of schooling where kids want to learn, 100% of the kids are engaged. They feel loved, supported. And the teachers, although exhausted from the pandemic, not one of them considered quitting. So I, I think what I, I, I fear that we're going to just go back to the the same way that we did it before, now try to solve a bigger problem with the same methods and just say, more school, longer school days, more instruction. And it doesn't, it doesn't take the nature of the child or learning into account. Thank you. A bloviated Florida. <laughs> <laughs> There's a question. Oh, oh do you want, oh, do you want, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Can I come up here? <laughs> Do you want to come up? Sure. Yay. I don't know if I have a question, but maybe just some kind of comments. Um, my name is Lori Fields. I'm a licensed clinical social worker, and I'm the executive director of our teen center in Wilton. Um, I have been researching human behavior and specifically what keeps us or prevents us from reaching meaningful goals um, in our life. I started off working with adults and now I'm delighted to be working with the teens in our town, but um, I've discovered that at the core of what keeps us stuck is this story of not good enough. Mm -hmm. And the story of not good enough has its roots in adolescence. And every single one of us has it. And every single one of us has a deeply unique um, story around how our own story of not good enough was shaped. And there's a variety of different ways in which that happens. Um, my concern in what's happening now is that students of all different ages um, are really not feeling good enough. <laughs> 
because of this loss of learning and because everybody learns in different ways and because our school systems, and this isn't a critique of any one school system, but our school systems tend to teach in a very specific way for a specific kind of learner. And it's quite unfortunate for kids who are um, smart in a variety of different ways and then end up going through our school system feeling not good enough and feeling not smart enough. And I can say with my professional work with very high achieving adults that your story of not good enough plays out in your adult life for the rest of your life um, and informs every decision that you make until you really understand your own story and the grip that it really has on your life. So one of my concerns is as a school, how can we talk more with our kids around this, um, around normalizing and really showing them that the last two years was so difficult for everybody and that struggle for them right now it is appropriate. It's a normal thing that, that all of us are going through as a community so that a kid isn't sitting there saying, wow, I'm really struggling with you know, whatever the thing is and feeling really not good about themselves. I think we have, I mean, I, we all know that we have a national mental health crisis on our hands and so until we're able to offer kids an environment at school and outside of school, and this is what we work on at the teen center, is wherever you are with yourself, you know, we need to really keep enforcing that story of like, you are good enough and you are smart enough. And this was very, very difficult. And so, you know, we're gonna help you get through this time. One of the things I'm most concerned about as a community and just in my own you know, parenting, I have three middle school age kids, is we can't just do more. Like everyone here is saying, we can't add more, we can't expect more, we can't work longer and harder. We need the exact opposite of that. I think everybody needs a break. Everybody needs some relief. And I'm concerned, like you were just saying, that the solution isn't work harder, longer, more. Um, and again, teachers are, are exhausted. Um, so I'd love to hear, um, you know, part of the conversation around, so what, how do we rethink how kids can get some relief without, um, you know, I, I, I've seen in this past school year that there's almost this, we got to compensate for the loss in the past two years. So there's more homework, and I'm seeing it with athletics as well, which is really, really a concern of mine. We're going to put in more time on the sports field. We're going to add more dinners. We're going to add more community time. We're going right, and it's it's a you know I'm all about community and fostering you know all all of that and work, teamwork and being with your team, but it's killing the kids and the families, and. Um, and I don't think a lot of people want to act, want to stand here and say it's too much, but it is too much. And I think that it 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 hurts the kids too to witness parents driving around like crazy, trying to keep up and get your kids to all of these things when really what everybody needs is dinner together and some more downtime <laughs> and not to feel not to feel, um, you know, shame from the community if you're not participating in every single thing or showing up to every single thing. I, I'm, you know, I'm a big advocate of like, what, what can we do to simplify and slow down and offer kids an opportunity to learn in the way that works best for them? I'll share this one last thing is my kid went to this thing called Camp Invention, which is like the summer program at one of the schools. And he learns a little bit differently. And he came home from camp invention and said, oh, why can't school be like this? Mm -hmm. that's great. And it like almost made me cry. I'm like, that's what school should be like, camp invention. You know, so you go to the different things and you learn in the way that you learn and you feel great about yourself. And if you like to build, you build. And if you want to work on something else, you work on something else. And I know what we're talking about is a massive overhauling and it's going to take a while. But um, kids, kids learn best when they are in a relaxed, happy, 
positive, calm state. Everyone learns best from that state. And so I'm concerned that we're moving in a direction where we are devaluing that that, that is a foundational piece that has to happen in order to get where we want to go. Yeah, because we hear from some kids. Yeah, kids. Young people. Sorry about the kids. I'm a senior in Staples High School, right in this town. Um, so I was kind of interested about this idea of resilience that you all were talking about. Mm -hmm. So um, when I was in middle school, I was part of the wonderful gifted program that we have here. And it was just like what you were talking about, where um, in this program, there were these opportunities for students to direct their own learning <laughs> and to really follow what they were interested in. And it was sort of like the teacher there was only teaching to a small group. It was about 11 students. And we would choose what, we want, what, we, what projects we wanted, we wanted to pursue, what we wanted to uh, discover for ourselves. And she was sort of like this um, guide for us, where she wasn't necessarily the expert. She wasn't lecturing us and, and the one necessarily giving us information, but rather the person who was guiding our efforts to discover for ourselves. And I always thought, like, in a similar way, that it's not just, like, uh, like students that are identified as gifted that would respond well to this. You know, I think that most students at the school would, would benefit greatly. And for myself, I think it, it was big for me in developing confidence and resilience. Because from a young age, when you have this experience of guiding yourself and discovering for yourself what's important in your learning, um, you know, when I got to high school, that became a great asset for me. Because it wasn't the first time that I was experiencing, like, you know, needing to do a project on my own and, and discovering what, what to do. But then I'm also, I, you know, I'm sort of wondering, amid this like need for standardization, uh, you know, with college processes and people needing to uh, test well, and then this push for classes like AP classes where it's not, you know, your own learning. It's it's about uh, demonstrating excellence and everything. How do we how do we kind of balance this, you know, pursuing learning for yourself and being resilient? with wanting to demonstrate on a nationwide standardized process that you are, that you're doing well. Good question. We have to get up here. Wow. Thank you so much. I wanted to say all of this, but there was no time. There was <laughs> nothing better than hearing a student uh, say that. I was going to offer three um, solutions, and they all went to what you just addressed. Children have an opportunity today to use what gifted education has been preaching for decades, which is, and that would also answer your question, how do you perform while doing work that's your interest. What we, uh, what the gifted pedagogy is about, is about focusing on students' strengths. And that can be done actually, is what Josh just said. There are all of these requirements on teachers. And if we keep piling these requirements on teachers, they will break, especially under all of these mental problems they are fa facing today, and some will get the support and some won't. So if we get to know our students, all of our students, just exactly what you said, it's gifted pedagogy for all students. And that's the same for special education as it is for gifted and the general population. Let's find out, let's make sure that teachers know their students' strengths. I would like to see something like a brief one-page one IPA where the teacher and student and the parent will sit at the beginning of a school year and will take a little note 
what is the child interested in? Why? Is it consistent? What does the parent see? What does the child say? What does the teacher say? Because you can be interested, but you, cannot, you may not be committed. So there are different issues. And you're resilient only when you are doing harder work than you think you can do, and you succeed in it. So it cannot be too hard, but it has to be hard enough. So you have that idea of success, and that gives you a leg up in the competitive uh, world of work, workforce, especially in the global market. So strengths, uh, strengths focus. The second thing is, let's give the children what you also got in your program, more autonomy in choosing within the well uh, established guidelines. This is what the goal is for grade five this year. Okay, these are the topics. This is what we need to achieve. Now, according to student strengths, let's give them more. Let's give them more autonomy to prepare projects according to their interests, but within the rubric that's uh, uh, school wide, or maybe just for that teacher, and then. You test, maybe not as often, uh, but you test at the end of the year. That's what they do in Norway, for instance. And um, we also free the teacher. If we give students more autonomy, we're freeing the teachers because then the teacher, like in your example, comes in and says, oh, you're interested in this, but you have so many ideas and you don't know how to organize it. And then the teacher sees, okay, this student doesn't know how to organize things. Let's teach them that. Okay, it takes maybe 10 minutes, okay, for this student. Maybe there are more than one like that. We can have a small group and, and students can come and say, okay, we need to learn how to plan. Things like that. So that's what gifted education does. And I think it works actually out of Yukon. There are this couple of great researchers, the Renzulis. They have oodles of, of research showing that anything that works in the field of gifted education benefits every child, including special education child. Or of course, it's all adjusted. Gifted kids need more speed, they need more depth, with special education students, you go maybe slower, but you still try to find what's best in them. And instead of telling them, oh, you can't do this, you can't do this, let's work on that, that you don't like because you're bad in it. No, let's find what, you, what you, good you're in, and then all the problems that you have will try to find within your interest zone. So, Thank you again. And also, gifted kids are perfectionists, and they are always not good enough. So not good enough is an is a illness of all of us, but especially for kids who, who are higher achievers, because gifted kids are asynchronous. They may be good in academics, but terrible in social emotional. So these are all pitfalls that, uh, but again, if we pay attention to these things, all kids uh, will, uh, will benefit. Sorry for being that long, but it's just so exciting to hear a voice that really was everything I wanted to say. Thank you. If I can just add a, I don't know even what I want to call this, but I, all this is great. I, I went to a gifted high school and I did poorly in it for a while because um, I was that kid who sat in the back of class and never yeah. you know, made jokes and yeah. learned everything but really did, couldn't handle an environment where I was surrounded by people who actually had that and good study habits. Um, but you know, I, I think obviously this is great that we're talking about sort of reimagining education for students but I, I have to give you a bit of realism as well that as I'm listening to all of this, you know, there's a there's a great deal of, of of constraint in what I can do to modify what I teach. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We have a 126 credit uh, degree program that is accredited, and in those 126 credit 
in that 126 credit program, there are only six credits of free electives. Everything else is required by our accrediting organization. And it's even more than that because we could, I suppose, petition our accreditor to change what we would be accredited on. But for the students who go through our program and wind up working in laboratories, the laboratories accreditors will quite literally go to the college transcripts to see whether or not the analysts have the underlying education to be doing what they should be doing, whether that's biochemistry, to uh, statistics, forensic chemistry, forensic biology. And so there, there are a lot of limits to how much freedom we have in sort of reimagining what we teach students. Now, all that being said, one thing that um, I'm trying this year to improve how students do is we, were we, were we have a class that's a four-credit combination lecture and lab. And for this year, we are breaking it apart and we're making it a three-credit lecture and a one-credit lab. And that doesn't sound very revolutionary, I know. But if we choose the better lecturers, we choose the people who connect with students better in a lecture setting, we kind of give them a bit more of energy so that when they go into the more difficult lab piece of that, they have more interest in getting through the lab piece. And we've noticed that that particular class is, is, is pivotal in whether or not students continue with the major. And so if we can improve the delivery and, and sort of get their buy-in so that they, they enjoy the experience more, they kind of are, are ready to get into the next level, in obviously more difficult work. So, you know, there are a lot of things that will kind of push against or create resistance as we try to sort of reimagine how we teach. And I think the real challenge is how do we, how do, we do that within the constraints we have? But you're, talk, you're talking about um, college. Yes. So I think, I think by the time they get there, they have been so standardized, brutalized, what, what, whatever, they, whatever has happened to them has forged a pretty strong character. They can still change, but I think what Maya is talking about is giving kids that the, the conditions that create resilience from their earliest days so that by the time they get to college, they're not tempted to get the chemistry professor fired because they didn't like yes. the score. On the <laughs> that, that's, what, that's what I'm talking about. And, and I, I, I think it's interesting to look, and I know you have access to data on this. Where are the pockets of flourishing during the pandemic? And I've found only one school system that produced kids that kept on learning, that, that um, didn't lose their minds and that didn't lose teachers. And it was a school in which there is almost, there's no curriculum. The kids have to teach themselves. So from their earliest days in the schools, they're learning how to deal with boredom. They're learning how to get along with others. They're learning how to construct their own education. And during the pandemic, I received one of the most amazing documents I've ever seen. It was the college application of a young woman who went through 12 years of doing whatever she wanted. And she wrote the college ap application. And in it, she said, in my life, I've only had one math class. That was the math class I asked for when I decided I wanted to go to college. I took it when I was 16. In my life, I've only had one reading and, uh, or, or one writing class. I took it at the local junior college and I signed up also so I could function in college. But I used to read books all the time and I was, it was, she went through all the reasons why having no school at all, almost no school, left her in a great position to be a great student and I was utterly convinced. And so was the college that gave her $350,000. Um, scholarship. We, the harder we parent, the more we helicopter, the more we push, the more we bribe, the more we punish, the less self-regulation kids develop for themselves. And so one of the upsetting um, facts about trying to narrow the achievement gap between the haves and haves nots is that one of the approaches has just been to work these kids to death and to control them to death, to put them in charter schools where every move they make is controlled. <laughs> and what the upsetting data is that even though these kids have beautiful test scores, 
beautiful handwriting, uh, and good grades. They're like they're highly likely to drop out of college in their first year. Because the more they grow up being controlled and regulated, the less they internalize an internal regulation system, which is what Maya is talking about. So they need autonomy not when they get to college, they need it from their earliest days, That's and they true. need to learn how to deal with freedom so that the first time they're free isn't when they're 18 and mm -hmm. there's alcohol surrounding them and mm -hmm. all of that stuff. Right. Um, I think there's another, love to hear your another, thoughts about this. There's another comment or question. Yeah. Right. Hi. Um, uh, Vanessa Elias, a living Wilton, a mental health activist and certified parent coach. And um, the question, there's so much that I have. I, I call that the dirty little secret um, because the kids end up dropping out of college, right? We don't know. They got the bumper sticker. They've got the name in the paper if their town's still doing that. But then they're home, and that's the secret, that they're home, suicide attempts, drug, and I feel like that is really important piece of information to get out so that parents understand, right? They only see till that graduation photo. They don't understand the consequences of their actions. Um, I had a couple of thoughts and questions. One is, where are these schools? Watch us with the names. Um, and how do we help? Because I feel like this is, in my work, in my own personal life, I have three um, kids, 21, 18, and uh, 14. I'm not OK. Like, I keep acting like I'm okay. I work hard. I can't do what I did before. I just don't have it. I have a headache by the end of the day. I need to, there's so much more. So how do we gain the executive functioning? So how do we, how do we heal that? What was the, the piece about our own uh, drop in executive functioning skills? I mean, I think it is not to do more, right? We're all trying to do more. But it's again, we can't do what we did before. We're, we're, we have an injury. We have trauma. And so how do we, I, I guess that's my question, is how do we, I would love any tips actually on how to do it for myself, how do we find that executive functioning again, besides the, the grand shift I think we need to make in the American public education system, it's just not working on the um, for so many, so anyway. I have comments on the, um, on the school system and changes in the school system, but I want to see if anyone wants to speak to parent mental health. <laughs> Andrea, thank you. I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I mean, I guess I, I would, I would say it's um, we're talking about adult mental health, right? Because whether you're a parent or not, we're all we're all coming through this pandemic. Um, From my viewpoint, um, executive functioning is a set of disciplines. It's a set of practices. Um, and so, as with anything else, the answer is to begin small, implement one small habit that's different, right? And then add to those habits. And they start to generate momentum, it, you know? So, thinking about what's the one area. You know, I, I need to plan my day so that I can accomplish these three things every day, right? So one of the things, I, I personally lost some executive functioning skills. So I'll tell you what I began the practice of doing. Working from home was very difficult for me. I, I need the structure of my office, my account. I need that. Um, working from home was very challenging for me from an executive functioning perspective. So I had to start to implement some strategies um, that I don't normally have to do in an office setting. Um, I had to get up at the same time every day. I had to go to bed at the same time every day. I had to get up and get dressed in real clothes, right? <laughs> My COVID athleisure collection had to go in the drawer because I needed to wear real shoes. I couldn't wear flip-flops and slippers. I needed to do that because it changes how my neurology works, right? I needed to decide the three things I needed to accomplish every day to make me mentally healthy. So I knew I needed to exercise. I had to find different ways to do that because the way I exercised before no longer worked for me. It was a closed. So I had to find something else, and then I had to have the discipline to do it, right? So I think there are, you know, finding the one small habit you can begin 
with and then adding to those habits. Um, you know, people will say, you know, it's about motivation. And I would say it's never about motivation. It's about discipline, right? It's about knowing something you need to do every day and get and planning your day so it gets done and giving yourself the time to do it. Um, so I think we can work with kids. You know, I, I heard you loud and clear about, you know, regaining time outside of school and youth sports and all of those things. I see what parents are doing running kids around. And I would say it's time for parents to say, enough's enough. We need our family life back. And that's kind of, sorry, right? that's really what my question, like, what can we do, collect, what kind of, how can we have this culture shift happen, right? How can we, because it, it is about being, giving yourself grace and self-compassion and, and all those things, but like having these conversations are so important of understanding that this is a reality for us. Because I feel like we, you know, that putting it in the rear view mirror thing, we all want to forget about it. It doesn't matter if we want to forget about it or not. It's still part of our reality. And so how do we how do we make that? And I think shift? the message has to be shifted. Like college isn't the end game for you. Because that's not working anymore. And kids aren't doing well in college there, right? So like we have data now that says like what's happening freshman year in college is a whole lot of mental health problems, right? And so collectively as parents, it's not about play this many sports, get this great National Honor Society, and then you go to college and you live a great life. Like, that's not the formula, but we're still living like that's the formula. We have to make getting into college not the end game. Yeah. Yes. Right? Exactly. And so, because right now the end game from a pre-K-12 perspective is getting to the college of your choice. Um, getting to the competitive college, it doesn't really think about what you do once you're there. It get it's getting in, and we see it on you know getting in day when everybody's in their sweatshirts and mm -hmm. the whole thing's happening. We need to start to think about education <laughs> as a lifelong process, and the getting into college shouldn't be an arms race. It shouldn't be that people start at fourth grade worrying about what math curriculum you're in so that you can get to the right college. Those things are real in our culture, and we have to confront them. Um, and so we have to I'm so arbitrary. Yeah. You talk to parents all the time. Do you push back on their attitudes? Like I that? absolutely do. Yeah. Um, we talk about it a great deal. It's hard as a parent because we're in her school district, and, and they do. But as a kid that's an honor student that wants to go to one of those schools, he knows the boxes he has to check. He knows the thousand places he has to be a part of. And we tell him as parents all the time, you don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. But that's the stress they put on themselves because that's what they're told to give them there. I'm an interviewer for one of those college colleges. I have no idea what it takes. I've been interviewing for, I would say, 13 years. Never have any of my applicants gotten in. And they've all been amazing, amazing, you know, honor society, multiple APs from ninth grade, and they don't get in. So I say to my daughter, who's a sophomore, there are, the U.S. has the strongest um, institutions of higher ed across the board. So if you go to UConn, if you go to UNH, if you go to Yale, you just have to make the best of it. You can get a great education wherever you go and don't kind of put all your hopes on this one magic college because it's honestly completely arbitrary. As far as I can tell, um, I've had one kid waitlisted and, and uh, you know, multiple kids who I would have admitted in a heartbeat not get in. But the whole thing is it's not just one. It's across the board. I mean, you're talking about the top 50 and you have a straight A student honors, AP, across the board in everything possible, and they're still not accepted. Yeah. I mean, it's really hard Which for is, these kids. Absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm staring down the barrel at that question. <laughs> right? Like, I know. Can it's I, really hard for the family. Can I say something as a parent of um, three and um, a grandmother of six? Um, and I've talked to the many officers. Uh, officers. They tell me, and my daughter once worked in an admission office, you know, was one of those... Um, tour guides that walk backwards mm -hmm. at a college and she would tell me she said there's like four or five piles and they often say the second wave or tier 
could all get in. Yeah. They were just as exceptional as the first two. So they have these folders for different parts of the country being represented, <coughs> a different makeup on gender, uh, different, um, uh, there's even a legacy folder, you know, for people that have families that have gone there before. And uh, then in what department do we need more? What is the college uh, emphasizing at that particular state? So a lot of it, if not 90%, has nothing to do with the tremendous capability and record that you would have as a student. So I would try to tell my kids that in advance so they wouldn't be disappointed because a lot of it has nothing to do with their capability. Mm -hmm. they, could, they could admit the second tier or even the third, and they're just as capable. I think we should move to a lottery. <laughs> <laughs> I totally do. Truly. Once you hit a certain Truly, level yeah. of ability, you yeah. could wipe out all the anguish. Like yeah, I feel right. like it's right. And don't charter schools do that? Don't they have a lottery? Yeah. 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 Right? Well, Somebody is it, well, yeah. So uh, then they, we should advertise that, because <laughs> I get letters from students later when they don't get in saying, what is wrong with me? So I say, well, it's a lottery. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, an interesting data point that I have when I look at retention, right? because obviously I want to obviously look at my students and like, well, what makes them stay? What, what causes them to leave? And grades are obviously an issue. But an interesting data point is how early do they uh, apply? Mm -hmm. The earlier a student applies to a program, at, at least uh, the last year aside, mm -hmm. Uh, the more likely they are to persist in the program, regardless of what their grades are. Uh, and, and I don't know what that means for you all as parents, but maybe the sooner your son or daughter knows what it is that they want to do, the more that they work towards that goal, and perhaps the more resilient they are when the inevitable struggle occurs. I only say that because that actually surprised me a little bit. I didn't pay much attention to when the applications came in, but it turns out that's a pretty big predictor and, and when I say retention, we're talking two years out. So are they still in our program as sophomores going into junior year? And it turns out the earlier they apply, meaning I get people who are, who are they've already toured our campus two or three times as juniors. That's the kind of early applicant that is somebody who, regardless of what their grades are, is going to stick in the program. I, um, we all lost executive function, so I finished my PhD during the pandemic. So I had to develop executive functions that I didn't know I was capable of. And so I, and I've actually talked to the incoming students to kind of share with them personally how I struggled and the things that I did to try to cheat myself or, you know, kind of outwit myself so that I could do a lot of work. Because if you put on your to-do list, write dissertation, I can guarantee you that will never get done. <laughs> And so it turns out that I have, I have learned about myself, what time of day am I able to focus the best? What temperature does my room need to be in order to get my best thinking? What, obviously, playlists can I, you know, and so I have, and, but meanwhile, if you ask your children, they know a lot of these things about themselves. They know what time of day. There are other people who do work in the morning. I feel sorry for you, but I, you know, you know who you are, right? Um, and you know what? If you just get people to be introspective for a moment and get them to think about, well, what are those things about you that you know coax you into doing your best work? Well, then structure your environment to force that to occur so that you have these pockets of, of, of real flow state kind of work. And then the other piece, and this is the part that's really hard to, for people to grasp, is that let your mind wander. I know I'm good for about 20 or 30 minutes, and then I have to disengage and do something completely meaningless, but I know I only have a five or 10 minute window before I have to get back into work. And it allows me to sort of get that fidgetiness out and get back to work, and I am infinitely more productive when I have these like waves of productivity, yes? So all the things you just shared are like the most beautiful, accurate description of like how an individual allows themselves to be in their best state in order to be productive and happy and satisfied and all of that. And so how do we bring that into the school system so that children are taught in that way that you need to honor who you are, how you work best, and feel good about that process, even if it looks different from how another kid needs to do it? So, it, so here's what I did, and it's a great question. And so I spoke to all of our incoming students. We have, you know, orientation sessions in the summer. And I shared a bit of that, but what, here's what I told them first. And I said, what do we all do when we're completely overwhelmed? Do we have more things on our to-do list than we have time to do? I said, do any of us really buckle down and do the work? And everybody sat there and nobody answered. I said, well, you know what I do? I play Fortnite. 
<laughs> and everybody laughed because that's the least productive thing you could do. But you realize counterintuitively that's what we do. When we're overwhelmed, we completely disconnect and we do something that actually exacerbates the problem and doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. But the fact is you've got to you've got to let that moment happen and do the thing that's unproductive so you can then re-engage. Mm -hmm. And so I think by humanizing it and telling my students, look, I'm I'm struggling too. Here are the things that I did, and it wasn't a linear process, and it wasn't something I could do in a day, but I eventually deconstructed myself to understand what do I need to do to create a, an environment where I can work. Now, for students in college, that obviously means, can you work in your bed in your room with a roommate nearby, or do you need to pack up and go to a library? Can you sit in a Starbucks with the ambient noise, or do you need AirPods with a particular playlist. I can tell you I listen to binaural beats when I really need to do the work. And the first song on that playlist already primes me mentally to start to do the work. And I think if we can start to teach people these other skills so that they can sort of hack themselves, because I think you said it, it's, you know, at some point what we have to teach people to do is to teach themselves. Because college is the end of the line. And in addition to that, you also have professors and teachers who are not effective. And so, yes, I'm learning. I have, yes, I have that class. It's on my schedule, but I'm not getting much out of the lecture experience. And so I need to supplement that myself. My, my concern is that what you're expressing is so important for teachers to be able to share with their students and offer their own experiences as a guide. But our teachers are, have so much to get through and so little time and are working in a way that they're trying to compensate and do the best they can with, you know, with what they have. How, how do we move in that direction? Like what needs to happen systemically with schools so that it allows for more of what you're talking about? Uh, could I yes, please. That because I don't have the answer. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answer, but it seems to me that this is one of the things that makes me feel optimistic about the future and what the current uh, State Department of Education is doing, putting a lot of emphasis in social emotional learning and starting in preschool. We are also putting this emphasis on kids who are getting ready for school. So what does that mean? That social emotional learning is a set of, actually they are learning a set of skills that let them, little children, they will know about themselves. They will know whether they can study in bed. They can know whether good uh, cold temperature is better for them or warm temperature. They will know that when the teacher is angry, it's not at them. They will know how to protect themselves from some of their uh, schoolmates because they will be able to, to verbalize their problems and maybe exchange and learn from each other better. So I believe it's really a set of concrete skills that if we instill them in children at an early age, it will go all the way to the adulthood. So then when we are adults, we already know that, and maybe we won't feel that I'm not good enough anymore, because maybe in the fifth grade, there will be a whole uh, social emotional lecture and, and set of skills on how do you assess yourself so you feel good about yourself. So that's just yeah, what- My concern is what's happening there's a, there might be a lecture or a moment or a check-in pocket, a small window of time, but the actual learning and the actual experience of school is not set up that way. But it is being set up. And I mean, the teachers have a certain amount they have to put into a day, let's be honest. It's a lot to put into a day. Can I just say, one of the times that my local school was about, and I don't have the answers at all, um, I'm a big, strong advocate of social emotional learning. My struggle that I have is that it feels like, even in our school system, we're going to carry on and do most of all the other stuff we already do and squeeze social emotional learning yeah. in as well. Yeah. And it's like, and I think we're going to ask students and teachers and parents to do more again. And I think that we're going to find in a few years' time, we've just compounded the problem. And I think we need to kind of unravel it and work out how do we put those skills into the system but change some of the existing things that are happening.
So that's what I'm hoping CSDE is actually planning to take your concern into consideration. I'm just hoping. This is just the beginning. If you look at their website, they have all the plans spelled out in some ways already. Um, so. But I think that's to connect with the teachers. Who yes, point, obviously it being is. Asked, and I know, you know, but they're being asked to do more and more and more. And the concern that I have about social and emotional learning is not the, the idea of it, but it's going to be more descriptive things for the teachers to add to their existing. But that's what I'm saying. It's been planned within the system. So let's hope. I, I know that they are very thoughtful <coughs> about these plans. So I'm just hoping. Uh, so I think there. There's two things that I would say here. One is, I think one thing that's important to recognize is that, to your point, we have to put less, we have to expect less from our schools and from our parents and, and recognize that we have a societal responsibility to do some of these things. Mm -hmm. Part of the reason this is so hard is because we are privatizing so much of what it takes to raise a, a society and, and a group of children, mm -hmm. right? Like, we moved into this world where instead of having extended family supports, we just don't, and we expect that, like, families will be able to do this and that schools will pick up the slack. And so I think that, one, it's important to recognize that because I think that schools and parents feel blamed or feel responsible for solving this problem. And it's, it's a societal failure, and we have to decide to invest our resources differently, and we have to decide that we shouldn't expect families and schools to be the only people that have a stake in the success of our children. So I think that's like one thing that I think is just important to recognize. The other thing that I would say too is, I, I think the, the optimistic part of me is, I think we've learned so much, there's been so much great research about in the last 20 and 30 years about how do people actually learn? Mm -hmm. What are the, con how do you create the conditions where people can thrive? And the, the problem is it's not getting into our schools. Yeah. And this is where I actually think there's a real opportunity with the pandemic for us to say, we actually have like great research about how do you create a community where people feel safe to take risks, where people feel safe to make mistakes, where people feel safe to connect with people who might be different than them. How do you affirm someone's identity in a, in a way that allows them to build confidence? The problem is not that we don't have ideas about how to do this or that there's not a body of research. It's that our schools have been very resistant to it. And to your point, you know, everything that we know about social emotional learning is that it's not, hey, you have a morning meeting block where we talk about our feelings, although that matters and it's helpful. It's training our teachers on how to recognize, oh, you look like you're having a hard time with this math problem. And so I'm actually going to like send the rest of the class into a conversation with the part person next to them and I'm going to come check in on you. And I'm going to say, hey, and just put your head down. What do you need? How can I help? Instead of yelling at them or telling them to pick their head up or just assuming that they'll figure it out on their own. And so I do think, you know, th there are ways to do more with less if we make a commitment to saying, like, let's take this huge body of really good, thoughtful research and figure out how do we apply it in schools. And, and frankly, I don't even think that it would require a total overhaul of what we're doing. There are really, really easy things that we can do to make our schools feel better, to, and to your point, uh, for both kids and adults, right? Because when kids are excited and learning, adults are excited and happy, and we create a virtuous cycle. Mm -hmm. So that's what I would add. Right, right here. I think uh, Morgan had something to say. Very patiently to do it. Thank you. <clears throat> so I think we really, we've talked about time and how time is in short supply, but I think we could interrogate that that assumption. I mean, we've set up our schools and our school districts to run 180 days a year and kids graduate after 12th grade and that sort of thing. But what what if we what if we said kids don't necessarily graduate after 12th grade? Maybe they stay into 13th grade. Maybe some kids graduate in 14th grade. Maybe some gra maybe some kids graduated after 9th grade or 10th grade. What if we change, right? For so long our system has been set up where Time is constant. We can't change time. So what does change? Learning. What if we said we want all kids to get to point X in learning, and for some kids it's going to take this amount of time. For other kids it's going to make the, take that amount of time. And we're not going to put so much pressure to shove more and more learning into, into a structure, into a finite amount of time. 
So the students who arrive to work at, uh, to go to Peter's classes actually have the skills. Maybe some are 20, maybe some are 15, but they have the skills and they're able to engage with the content. I mean, we do that with college, right? Some kids graduate in three years, some kids graduate in six years, some kids, or maybe not kids, some people <laughs> graduate. <laughs> it's, I, I feel like this is a time when we, it would really benefit us to, to think about these assumptions that <coughs> schooling, K, you know, it's K-12 schooling. Maybe we need to really investigate that. And then I think another thing, while we think about that, I think we really have to put, we have to kind of re-examine the schooling enterprise, and I think we should put joy at the center. And it's so funny that you brought up joy, because that was my mm -hmm. one change, was um, thinking back to Ted Sizer's work. He was a, mm -hmm. an educator for um, decades and decades, and he wrote about uh, going in and observing in high schools, and, and he observed that kids were the most joyful in the hallways between classes and in arts classes and in PE. And then they were absolutely flat in English and math and science. And so his whole question that oriented his work was how do we make high schools more joyful places? And I think that's that right now we need a lot more joy for adults and for kids. So I would suggest that schools should really think about how they can make the work of teaching and learning more joyful for for everyone who's yeah. in schools. And we know how to do it. That's the thing. I mean, yes, we, we it's do. It's all there in the literature. We just need to practice it. And I would love to see Westport and Wilton become sort of a leader in changing the mindset around college. Because even the kids that win in this system often do so at a great Price to their mental health. Even the kid, even the smartest, hardest working kids, and I've been interviewing a lot of them lately uh, because we're I'm working with the <clears throat> ETS to redesign the SAT, and so we had a bunch of young people were going through it, and one said, you know, I spent a lot of time learning, trying to learn the tricks of this whole game, stuff I knew going in that I wasn't ever going to use in my real life, but I had to learn it anyway. And I couldn't get my score up, and so I kept taking the SAT over and over again, because I had to go to Harvard. And so I, I, and I, developed, I developed an eating disorder. She got into Harvard, but she will constant, she, that will be with her forever. Because adolescents are, their brains are, this is when their brains are sort of going to they're most plastic, but then they harden. And so the bad things that happen to you in high school and middle school stick with you your whole life, whether it be an eating disorder or feeling tougher than the next guy. Those things stick with you, so we have to be very careful about it. And we know these things. What I would love for this to start is a movement towards teaching our kids how to take care of themselves and how not to want things that actually don't make them happy in the long run. There's so many happy people in this world that didn't go to Harvard <laughs> <laughs> that they need to be thinking about. Um, and I couldn't agree more that, you know, schools say, yes, it's good to have this, so let's shoehorn it in between math and science, and I watch this happen, because I teach meditation in schools, and that's a really popular thing. But when principals and superintendents say, um, how do we do this? What, how do we add meditation? I'll say, well, what are you going to get rid of to make room for it? And they, they, they don't have plans to get rid of stuff, but they're always asked to put in stuff. And so it's, it, it's designed to make people crazy and overworked. And it doesn't work. Mm -hmm. When I went to Mexico to give a, a, a speech a long time ago, both of my kids had been taking Spanish for eight to ten years at that point. And I said, how do I ask, where's the bathroom? And neither of them, after their ten years training in Westport schools, could tell me <laughs> the most practical use of something they'd been studying for a long time. And that is, our learning is so two-dimensional. Yeah. 
as soon as you go to Mexico, you'll learn it really quick because it, it's a problem you care about. <laughs> so I want to leave to you with my thing is let's give kids, let's not go easy on them, but let's give problems that they actually want to solve. And those problems naturally will turn into different adult problems that they want to solve. Kids for hundreds of thousands of years learn by just playing and imitating adults. We're not... We're no different than those kids. We're out of time. But, but not Any last comments? Yeah, right here. Yes, right here, kid. Hey, yes. kid. Yes. <laughs> Young yeah, please. So I have two things. Firstly, that uh, so I visited a school with Dr. Aronson that was a really amazing elementary school. And one thing that I noticed is that at my elementary school, we had scheduled in time for gym classes and music classes and art classes. Um, but we never had scheduled in time for focusing on community building. And on like working on student mental health and like at this school I sat in on one of their classes in which each student had to write a compliment for each every for every other student in the class and then they reflected on that. And something like that is just so beautiful and I think it really does make the students a lot happier. Um, and so that was the first thing I was thinking of. And then secondly you spoke about how the forensics department how students that want to join the program earlier tend to be those that are more successful or more resilient. And I feel like I struggle with that because like I'm a senior in high school right now and I'm going through the college admissions process and I think college admissions tends to reward students who know exactly what they want to do early in life and have like a spike and are able to I know a lot of kids who just have to say that some of their who just have to push away some of their interests because it doesn't fall in line with this like single spike that they can create for themselves. And I have a lot of friends who, like from the beginning of high school, they worked towards a certain spike that like was supposed to be their passion, and now only now are they realizing that they really don't want to study it, and it's not something that they're interested in, but they have no choice but to continue on this path. And so I don't know if there's any ideas on how to address issues like that. Um, yeah. <coughs> I just wanted to say something quick. I have been a single mom for 14 years, raising two teenagers, so I had to go for a parent on my best shape, like started in June, going at the gym every morning, 8.30, taking any class. But I want to say that it, it started with like going back to elementary school. I grew up in communism where we had organized exercises every morning before school started. And I was like, okay, I'll do this. And that brought me back to my childhood when I was happy. And I started working out, and I was like, why are they not putting on their programs every day some kind of physical exercise? And I love that you mentioned meditation. And for me, you know, it's like, okay, I'm letting you be who you are. And, uh, you know, depending on, like, then going in high school and teenagers with being with the social media or, like, labeling kids for certain mm -hmm. things, you know, I had to experience something like that. It was, not, it was tough, but I'm through it. I'm moving forward, and uh, I like that everything was discussed here. You know, it's very, how can I say, touching, because I grew up in communism when I was not free to speak what I wanted, and I came to this country, and I was like, where is this going, you know? And education is important. I did go to school as soon as I came here, and then with two children, completed my degree. So I know the education, and I try my best, but thank you for getting this and I'm glad I was part of it. What a, what a great place to end. And you yeah. can receive your payment in your mail. <laughs> <laughs> um, any final thoughts from our panel? I Thank think this so was much. wonderful yeah. what Morgan said about uh, let's bring the joy. Yeah. And I think if we keep that in mind, both teachers, for teachers, because teachers also need to be joyous. Mm -hmm. Teachers, parents are the most difficult because, uh, and children. Um, if, if we do that, then maybe children will make parents more joyous. <laughs> they bring it home. But anyway, thank you. I cannot thank our panelists enough. I think they deserve a huge round of applause. <laughs>
the one thing that people know about me is that I'm all about the food. And so, <laughs> <laughs> um, Sari's helped me with some, and she has these beautiful little Tell bags. You. And you cannot leave this room unless all of I'll that food goes to the bag and goes home. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.